Let us all pray. Um, thank you, Heavenly Father, for today, that we may call it today. Thank you for, for your word today. May it enrich us and continue to, to move us forward and, and get to know you. Um, bless today's messenger, um, Frank, as he, he, he sheds, sheds light on, on the truth that is your word. Um, may, may he be filled by the Holy Spirit. Let your spirit speak through him and let him exalt your son Christ and honor your word. Um, thank you for, for your son Christ. Thank you for the blood that has been shed. Thank you for um, taking the wrath that we deserve and liberating us into, into a relationship um, and a reconciliation um, to, to the Father. Thank you, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're turning to chapter 40. We'll be reading the entire chapter. Um, I'll go first. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against the Lord, the king of Egypt. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison where Joseph was confined. And one night they both drank, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream there was a vine before me. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. And in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from, from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Now the message by Frank Holman. Good evening, everyone. 
The title of the message today is How to Be an Effective Witness, and it comes from Genesis chapter 40. And uh, I think it's a good and relevant and timely passage to cover, especially as we are heading out, schools back in, we're heading back out to the campuses, we're on the app, we're communicating with each other, we're co-working together, and I think that uh, by God's grace we have this message today to learn how to be effective as we go out and spread the good news to students on campus. The key verse is verse 8, so let's read this together. Let's go. They said to him, we had dreams, and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So today we're going to talk about uh, three steps to being an effective witness. One is have an empathetic heart. Two is to rely on the Bible. And three is to preach the whole message. Let's pray. Uh, Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for a day of life. We thank you so much for an opportunity to worship today. We thank you for your word and that we could gather on this Wednesday evening. Help us, Lord, to absorb your word in our heart. Help us to be empowered and to be effective witnesses. Be with me uh, today, Lord, and help me to preach only your truth and only the things that you want me to say. Help me, Lord, to live this message, not to be a man with a hypocritical heart, but one that sets about to live according to your word as he preaches. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So in this first part of the passage, we're going to set the stage for what's uh, going on, right? So there's a little bit of a mystery that's happening in this part of the passage. There's these couple of guys, they're being sent to prison. They apparently did something wrong, but we don't really know why. So let's figure that out. Let's uh, read one through four responsibly, and I'll go first. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. Has anybody played this game? All right, a couple people. So did anybody have this game when it had this box? Okay, one, two people. This is like the way old school box. So this is the, this is the board game as I, as I remember it as a kid. So in this game, uh, for those of you that haven't played, you're basically trying to, it's like a whodunit, right? There's a murder that happened. You have to figure out who's the person that did it and with what weapon they essentially um, committed the crime with. And that's kind of what's going on in today's passage, right? So we see this, the cupbearer and the baker, they're imprisoned. So kind of the backstory, you know, it doesn't really say this to what's going on, is there was a, a plot to poison the pharaoh, right? So who, who did it? It must have been either the, cup, the guy that's in charge of his food or the guy that's in charge of his drink. So we don't really know. Let's just put both of them in jail, right? So that's kind of the, what's going on here. The cupbearer and the, the baker, They're in prison, and they're in prison uh, with Joseph at this time. So that's the background. Now we'll talk about part one, which is to have an empathetic heart. Let's read five through eight responsibly. I'll go first. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. So we asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? The parts that I uh, underlined here are the parts that stood out to me about Joseph's character, right? So he saw that they were troubled, and he asked, why are your faces uh, downcast today? Now remember, he's, 
in prison, you know, uh, un unjustly. You know, he didn't really commit the crime that he's in jail for. So what his heart could have been like is, hey, these dudes are associated with uh, the pharaoh, and they probably did something wrong, and they deserve it, and they're in jail, and good, good for them, right? And, but that's not, that's not what's in his heart, as you can see. So he sees uh, these two people, and he sees that they're troubled. And then he d doesn't just look at them and say, oh, they're troubled. He does something about it. He says, why are your faces downcast today? As I was preparing this message, um, I went through a skills assessment at, at work, right? So you do the skills assessment. They ask you like 70 questions or something like that. And then they, they rate them, right? OK, what are your top strengths? And what are your lower ranking strengths? And they judge it based on 40 different strengths. Has anybody done one of these things? They, like Gallup does them and stuff. A lot of times you do them at work. So this is how they break them down. Executing, influencing, relationship building, strategic thinking. So the very last one on my list was empathy. Right? That's the one that's, that's underlined here. And that struck me. And I probably shouldn't have done this, but I showed this to my wife, too. And <laughs> I, I, have, I have honest, like, uh, trouble, trouble with this. And it's interesting that even, like, this skills assessment uh, showed this to be the case. Even when, um, you know, my wife would come to me and say, I, I have a headache, and tell me again I have a headache, and tell me again I have a headache. And sometimes I just, I don't even respond. And I think like, you know, like, what can I do? Like, what can I do about that, you know? But there's something that I could do. I could at least care, <laughs> right? I could at least have an empathetic heart. And this spreads beyond, uh, you know, our, our house and our family, but to, to students as well. Matthew 9.36 uh, says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I'm wondering if sometimes, um, maybe you feel like this, maybe you don't, but I haven't gone to, onto the campus in a while, but sometimes when I did, I would uh, sit in the car for maybe like five minutes and think, man, I don't know what's going to happen, and so I'm going to get rejected, and this is going to be hard, and I'm going to be put in uncomfortable conversations for the next hour and a half, <laughs> right? Or however long I'm going to be here. And uh, that's, that's a struggle for me. And then I get out of the car, and then I you know, go onto the campus, and I sit somewhere where there's a lot of people gathering around. And then kind of the same thing happens. And I think, ah, I don't know if I want to talk to that guy. He looks like he's on the football team, you know? Or that person just doesn't look like the kind of person I, I would really talk to. And these are the kind of things that go through my, my mind. But what doesn't go through my mind and what should and what I'm learning from this passage is to have this empathetic heart. How do I see them? Do I see them as just a football player? Do I see them as just a person that I don't usually communicate with? Or do I see them like how Joseph was in prison and he saw the cupbearer and the chief baker? He saw that they were troubled. And then he cared about why their faces were downcast. And like Jesus saw them and they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And I, I pray that when I go on campus that instead of sitting in the car for five minutes and going to a place and thinking those thoughts that I just talked you through, that this would be my heart. That I would see the students you know, as sheep without a shepherd or like Joseph did. Why are their faces downcast? Care about them. Why are you troubled? And 
that's the first part that I'm taking away from this about how to be an effective witness. And I, this kind of goes in se sequential order, which is interesting too. Have an empathetic heart. And then the next part, part two is rely on the Bible. Let's read nine through 15 responsibly, I'll go first. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream there is a vine before me. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them to Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. Um, so the thing that we're talking about here is relying on the Bible. Okay, so we read the passage. We know that Joseph interprets the dreams, and then the interpretation comes true. And I've run into this, you know, actually quite a, quite a number of times where there's coincidences, right? You have coincidence, coincidence with Bible students. You have dreams, and you wonder, <clears throat> what does this dream mean, right? So we... I'm going to give you a couple examples, and we can rely on we can rely on dreams, we can rely on coincidence, but it's not. Sometimes the dreams or sometimes the coincidence can be true, and sometimes it cannot be true. But what we can really rely on is is the Bible, and uh, I want to give you a couple examples of things that I relied on recently. So. The, here's, here's one I was thinking of, too. It was, I think, Daniel a long time. This is a long time ago. He got his grades, and his grades were U, B, F, D, right? And he's like, man, that's a coincidence. And I was like, what is U? I don't even know that you can do, like, have a U. So I looked it up. It was, like, unacceptable for credit or something like that. And he's like, I'm not sure what the D stands for. Maybe it stands for Downey, right? <laughs> so that's a coincidence, or maybe not, but are we going to rely on these things, or are we going to rely on the Bible? So uh, for, for me, um, strangely in, the, in this passage, speaking of coincidence, like uh, I dream almost every night, and I almost always remember my dream. And I started writing these things down, and I started to take note of some of the more weird dreams, right? Because I was like, I'm having weird dreams. What do these things mean, right? So I want to show you the route that I took. So instead of relying on the Bible, I was like, I'm going to put these into ChatGPT and start like documenting my dreams and ask you know, AI tools what my dreams mean, right? So this is, this is one of them. And I don't read all of this, but I'll take you through it. So I dreamed there was an elephant on a platform. At the top, there was nowhere to go. At the bottom, there were two large plants blocking it from getting it down. It was fed, but had to remain clinging on the rope. Interpret this dream. So then it goes on to tell you, OK, the elephant is a symbol of strength, power, and wisdom. It represents a presence of influence in your life. In this dream, the elephant could symbolize a powerful force or aspect of your personality that feels trapped. The platform re represents a vantage point or a point of stability. It suggests you reach a certain level of, uh, or achieve something in your waking life. However, in the dream, the platform lacks options, indicating a sense of being stuck. There's nowhere to go at the top. There's two large plants blocking the way down. The presence of two large plants may symbolize obstacles or challenges that prevent you from moving forward or descending from your current position. Uh, and then clinging on the rope and being fed, it indicates that you're provided for or nurtured for in some way, even if you're unable to move freely. And then it says, overall, this dream seems to suggest a feeling of being restricted or in a limited situation. It may reflect the need to find solutions or overcome obstacles and explore new opportunities for growth. 
And I'm like, wow. Like, I know what I should do with my life now, right? And then I'll just tell you this one because I started doing this more. I dreamed I was at Disneyland. Each time I entered a ride, I was trapped there. It always seemed possible to get out, but at the last minute, I used all my strength and remained trapped. Then this one, it takes you through the details, and it says, overall, this dream may be prompting you to reflect on areas of your life where you feel stuck or powerless, and to consider what steps you can take to break free from those patterns and move towards greater freedom and fulfillment. So again, I was like, man, I'm seeing a pattern here, and the AI tools are able to detect the patterns, and now I know what I should do, right? Now I want to tell you another, uh, one, one other dream. This isn't my own. This is my wife's. So my wife, I don't know if you, you may know this or not, but my wife uh, used to be a Muslim. And when uh, she was born again, she had studied the Bible a lot, and she had studied the Quran a lot. She's like, I'm going to study both, and I'm going to see, you know, I'm going to make a decision based on on my learnings. And then uh, my wife started to have dreams too. And then in one of these dreams, she's falling down off of a cliff. And as she's falling down, she ends up being saved from falling down uh, by being caught on like a giant stone. And then she looks at this giant stone and it's a foot with a sandal. She's, and then she's wondering who's foot and sandal is this? And she looks up and it's Jesus, right? So the, the point is that sometimes, you know, you can, uh, like, there can be a coincidence and there can be a, a dream, and that can mean something. And there's these tools that you can rely on, like AI tools to interpret your dreams. But the real thing that we could rely on is, is the Bible, right? So like I said, my wife didn't just rely solely on that dream. You know, she'd studied the word, and she'd prayed a lot, and she prayed that God would answer her prayers. And she's very diligent in her Bible study. And it is the Bible plus the dream that spoke to her. So when we're talking to students, there's going to be times that come up like this, this coincidence, that coincidence. And it's hard for us as, uh, as Bible teachers to say, yes, do this, yes, do that. And I think that's kind of, at least for me, that's our instinct, you know? This dream means this, or this dream means that, so you should do this and you should do that. But I think the important thing is focus on the Bible, study the Bible, help them be guided in the direction that the Bible study is taking you through as you go through the Word of God. So step one, uh, have an empathetic heart. Step two, rely on the Bible. And then step three is to preach the whole message. Let's read 16 through 19. Uh, responsibly, I'll go first. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. So this interpretation turns out to be um, not so favorable, uh, to say the least, for uh, the, uh, the chief baker. Uh, and then the inverse for the, the cupbearer. But uh, Joseph, uh, he didn't shy away. You know, he interpreted the first dream, great, you know, and then this guy wants in on it too. But it's, you know, he knows the interpretation, he knows what he's going to say to this guy, but he doesn't shy away from it. And I think there's uh, also an important lesson here. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, I was studying with a student, and he's, uh, he wants to have a family. 
and he's struggling a lot to have a family. And he did have a, a son, and then when his son was only maybe like a week or 10 days old or something, his son didn't survive, right? And then now he, you know, is wanting to still have a family, but he's going through some tough times. And when we were studying through the book of John, then in John 16, there was this particular verse. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been uh, born into the world. And I read this beforehand, right when all this stuff was going on, and I was like, oh man, you know, like, I think we should skip this passage, you know? I'm not sure if we should read this, you know, he's, I don't know how he's going to take this, and maybe he won't want to study the Bible anymore, because this is just too close to home. So I didn't know what to do. I was like, either I skip it, or I kind of, you know, gloss over this, glance over this, this verse, or we talk about it. And I was thinking and praying, and I uh, thought, I, I'll just ask him, you know, up front, like, hey, there's going to be a hard verse in here, and I want to know if you are okay with that, right? And so I asked him, and he said, yeah, you know, like, the Bible is, the Bible is the Bible, and I want to know what the Bible says. And uh, he was actually, this guy had been drinking heavily and partying heavily and smoking weed and, you know, kind of just floundering through his life. And somehow, and I don't even remember exactly how, what, how this passage spoke to him, based on this passage, after doing this for 24 years and living like this, that he quit drugs and alcohol, and his heart was seriously, seriously changed. And it's between him and God to say if you know, he is truly born again. But I really think that he accepted Christ based on this passage. But if we just shied away from this passage and you know, the whole message of God was not preached, then this may not have been, been the case. And sometimes, yes, there are hard passages that we teach to students. And sometimes we talk seriously about sin and being right before God. But um, from this passage, we could learn that it's important to preach the whole message. Don't be um, scared of what the Word of God said. It's the Word of God. And these hard passages are sometimes what really impact people's lives and change their hearts to live for Christ. So Joseph had this frame of mind too. He wasn't scared to interpret the dream that was easy. He wasn't scared to interpret the dream that was hard. Acts 20, uh, just in part, uh, Acts 20, let's just look at 27. Let's read this one together. Let's go. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So the whole counsel of God was uh, preached here, and he testifies to that. Let's read uh, 20 through 23 responsibly. Let's go. Or sorry, I'll go first. On the third day, uh, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. So this is uh, essentially the conclusion of the passage, and we see that Joseph's interpretations come through or come true. So today we covered uh, three steps about uh, how to be an effective witness. One, to have an empathetic heart. Two, to rely on uh, the Bible. And three, to preach the whole message. And the thing that really stood out to me personally was the first part, to have an empathetic heart, not just for students, but 
in my home life as well. And my prayer is that even though my skills assessment says that empathy is last on uh, the list, that the word of God would overpower even, you know, what's in my personality and that empathy would rise to the top. Let me go back to the key verse again. Let's read this verse together. Let's go. They said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not the interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. Let's pray. Uh, Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today's passage. And we thank you for the three steps that we covered today. To have an empathetic heart, to rely on the Bible, and to preach the whole message. Lord Father, I pray that you would help us to hold on to this passage as we go out to witness to students in college campuses, to witness to our friends, to witness to our family. Help us, Lord, to have um, the right frame of mind. Help us, Lord, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit that we might have the courage to preach the whole message. And help us, Lord, not to rely on coincidence or dreams, even though sometimes they can mean things, but rather instead, Lord, to rely on the Bible. I thank you so much for this day of life, and I thank you for this time to worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.